Good morning, and I'm so glad you've joined us again on this Memorial Day, Monday, May 31st, as we continue our journey through the Book of Acts. If you don't have your Acts journal or a Bible right in front of you, I'd encourage you to pause this and run and get one. We're going to pick up at chapter 5, which was right where we left off. But to provide a quick recap, sort of last week on Acts, to provide a, a quick recap, Yesterday we, or on, I guess it was Saturday, we read about Peter and John preaching the good news and being arrested. And when they were finally released, their prayer wasn't that God would prevent them from seeing challenges again, but that God would give them boldness to continue to preach the good news of Jesus. And this boldness had a great impact on the early church. We read that, all things were owned in common. In other words, when someone was in financial need, the church was there to support them. And, and this had a huge impact as, as it allowed the church to provide for the needs of those around them and continue to engage new people in the body of Christ. Until we reach this couple in our reading today, Ananias and Sapphira, they want to be a part of the church, but they don't really trust that much. So they pretend, they lie, they pretend they've given everything they have over to the church, and when their dishonesty is revealed, they die. Dishonesty has a, 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 a profound impact, even a life-giving or life-taking impact in this passage. But the disciples continue on, they continue to do great wonders. They continue to amaze all those around them. And then the high priests and the Sadducees hear about this. They're appalled because people are beginning to trust in Jesus. So they have the followers of Jesus arrested and thrown into prison. And that night, while they're in prison, an angel flings open the doors of the prison and tells these followers of Jesus, to go out and to return to the temple, which is right where they were preaching before they were arrested, and to start preaching there again in the morning. When the morning comes and, and the jailers find that there's no one in these prison cells, they go to the religious leaders and they tell them there's no one there. While the, the, the religious leaders are trying to figure out what to do with this, someone comes and tells them that the exact same people who they arrested for preaching in the temple are back preaching in the temple. So this time they're a little nervous and they go to them and they kind of politely ask, will you please come meet with us? They don't quite know what powers are at work here, so they don't want to uh, play their hand before they understand their opponent. And at this point, they bring them before them and they give them strict instructions not to preach the name of Jesus anymore. They can't really do much more than that. They can't throw them back in prison. They're kind of afraid of the crowds, afraid of what's going on at this point. There's this, there's this funny underlying irony here where, where we know the Sadducees don't believe in resurrection or life after death. We know they don't believe in angels. And the irony here is, is what can they threaten the followers of Jesus with? We will kill you if you don't do this. Well, great. We'll go be with God, the guy we've been worshiping all along. Okay, we won't do that. We'll, we'll throw you in prison. Well, great, do that. The angels will let us out. It's, it's this, this funny irony to the situation where, where the Sadducees can't quite box the followers of Jesus in because they believe in something more profound than this world. So they tell the disciples, they instruct the followers of Jesus not to preach the name of Jesus anymore. And that's where we'll pick up with verse 29. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to these things. And so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. But when they, that's the religious leaders, when they heard that, they were enraged and wanted to kill them. But a Pharisee in the council named Gamaliel, 
a teacher of the law held in honor by all people stood up and gave orders to put the men outside for a little while. And he said to them, Men of Israel, take care what you are about to do with these men. For before these days, Thutis rose up claiming to be somebody, and a number of men, about four hundred, joined him. He was killed, and all who followed him were dispersed and came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean rose up in the days of the census and drew away some of the people after him. He too perished, and all who followed him were scattered. So in the present case, I tell you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or this undertaking is of man, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You might, even found, you might even be found opposing God. So they took his advice, and when they had called in the apostles, they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus, and they let them go. Then they left the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. And every day in the temple, and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that Christ is Jesus. This morning I want us to think for a few minutes about where God is calling each of us in our lives. This morning when I made my, my instant coffee, I, I put it in this mug, which was from a church that I was attending when I began to rediscern that God was calling me to be a priest. I want us to think today for a few minutes about where God may be calling us and how to discern God's will. We read about Peter's reply when he's threatened by, by these religious leaders. Peter says, we must obey God rather than men. We must obey God rather than men. Isn't that so true in, in so many of our lives, or fully true in each of our lives, I should say? We may be tempted to try to obey men, tempted to respond to what our culture calls us to do, tempted to respond to what our neighbors or our friends or, or even our spouse thinks we should do. But instead, our, our real calling is to respond to what God calls us to do. And the question, therefore, becomes, how do we do this? How do we figure out what God's will is for our lives, whether it's a big plan like a whole vocation, a whole career, or whether it's a little plan like how can I support my grandchildren who are struggling with their faith? Or should I maybe take on a part-time job in my retirement? How do we discern God's plans for our lives? It's interesting when Peter is brought before these, these religious leaders. There's one man who speaks up. He's a man named Gamaliel. He's a teacher of the law. He seems to be much older than many of the other people on the council because he remembers history that they don't seem to be aware of or thinking about. This is so important in each of our lives that we have people who bring different and more experienced perspectives in their own dimensions to our lives. I know if I think about our staff at St. Luke's, we have Deacon Rosemary, who was ordained, I think, before I even began seminary. We have people like Lowell, who, who was leading teams of people before I think they even graduated high school. On our vestry, we have people who have decades of wisdom and experience, who have children who are older than me in some cases. And they all provide phenomenal and valuable counsel for me because they have a breadth of experience and wisdom that I don't have. Now there are things that I have that some of them don't. I may know more Greek or more Hebrew. I may have more training in interpreting scripture or reading the Bible. And this is what's important for each of us, to have voices and perspectives in our lives that are not our own, that can help us understand the situations, the questions 
the discernment that we face in our lives. So this man, this, this elderly man, Gamaliel, has this advice. He says to the remainder of the council, you know, people have come before who have said that they're of God, but they're not. And the reason we know this is because things eventually fell apart with this man named Thutis, for example, or this man named Judas. Judas started a sort of rebellion when there was a new census so the government could raise taxes. Can you believe that? 2,000 years ago, the government would run censuses to get more tax money from people. But what we, what we see is this man gives this advice. Look, people have come before that have had great stories and great plans. But if these plans aren't of God, they eventually fail. The way he said it is, so in this case, I tell you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or this undertaking is of man, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. And the truth is, when you come to a crossroads in your life and you don't know where God is calling you, this may be what you're called to do. When you think God may be calling you to take a next step, the answer may be, take it. Try something new. Because if these plans are of man, if these plans are just yours, they'll probably fail. If these plans are of God, however, they will certainly succeed. Your prayer should be, God, help me take this new step, and if these plans are not your plans, help me fail quickly so I can figure out what your plans are. That's what I often pray in my life as we talk as a staff about what we're going to try at St. Luke's. I always say experiments are great. Let's try new things. If these plans are of man, if they're just a good idea that I came up with, It'll almost certainly fail, but if it's of God, if it's spirit-inspired, if God has breathed his life into it, great things will certainly come of it. So oftentimes, that's the best way to discern God's will. It's to take a step and to see what happens. Now, it's important to realize that when we take that first step, Things may not always be easy. You know, when I left for seminary, I faced challenge after challenge for a little bit. Things didn't fall perfectly into place for me. Things don't often do that in our lives. And that's not what happened for, for Peter or the other followers of Jesus either. They took this step. They were allowed to take this step. But they were first beaten we read that they were beaten, physically abused, because they were proclaiming Christ. This was certainly God's will for their lives, but that doesn't mean it was easy. And that may be the case for you. Maybe you're called to go serve someone who doesn't really want your help. And maybe at first you will face, you will face pushback or, or anger but that doesn't mean it's not God's plan. We have to steal and prepare ourselves for, for roadblocks, for challenges. And if we're following God's will, all of this will eventually crumble away. Now, the eventually at the end of the Bible is revelation, so it might take a little while to get there. But our call is to be faithful through all of this. So what is it in your life that you think God may be calling you to do? Who might God be calling you to serve? Who might God be calling you to pray for or share the good news of Jesus with? If these are the questions you're facing, there are a few things you should do. Three in particular. First of all, find people who have wisdom and experience and perspective that's different from yours and get them to pray with you, get them to talk with you, get them to counsel you and advise you. Second of all, 
If you're unsure, maybe take a step in faith. Move forward. See what happens. Because as Gamaliel said, if these plans are of men, they will certainly fail. But if these plans are of God, they will certainly succeed. So take this step. Experiment. Try something. See what God might be calling you to do. And then, third of all, brace yourself. Because even when you're following God's plan for your life, there will be challenges. There will be suffering and disruption and disappointment. But this doesn't mean God is not in charge. It doesn't mean you're not following God's plan or God's path. Instead, you can rejoice in this suffering, just as Peter did, knowing that you are serving a greater purpose and even the sufferings of these days will fade away when you rejoice with the knowledge that you have fulfilled God's plans for your life. Now, my brothers and sisters, on this Memorial Day, as we remember people who gave up their lives for something greater than themselves, who gave up their lives in service to this country, let us each bow our heads as we consider God's plans for our lives. God, we pray that you strengthen us. We pray that you give us discernment. We pray that you place us in community. Place us in communities that can provide us wisdom and perspective as we consider your will. Give us discernment to try to test out where your will is and take steps forward in faith. And give us strength that when we face disappointments or challenges, that we will continue onward when we are following the path you have laid out for us. Help us remember the words of Jesus today, who said there is no greater love than to lay down your life for one another. As we remember and give gratitude for those who laid down their lives for us, for this country, for the freedom and the freedom to worship you in particular. God, we pray that you bless all the members of our armed services, bless the freedom of this country, and bless the freedom to worship you that each of us have, that we may discern your will and faithfully follow it each day. In your Son's holy name we pray. Amen. My brothers and sisters, I look forward to seeing you again tomorrow morning as we enter a new month and as we consider where God is leading us as we enter a new chapter in the book of Acts. God bless you on this Memorial Day.